We're in a series about the key that opens every door. And the key is actually giving, though we're not talking about money. Uh, the first uh, lesson in this series was about forgiveness. The, the word give is actually in there, and the amazing things, the doors that can be open uh, if we're willing to extend forgiveness. And last week we talked about worship, the kinds of things that become possible and, and the kind of potential that becomes possible when we're willing to worship. And everyone worships something or someone, but when we worship God, that's the thing that opens doors. And today we're going to talk about another way that we give of ourselves, and that's through serving. And we're in Ephesians, the second chapter, and I have to warn you that it, it's no wonder that lots of people who are not part of Christianity get offended by Christianity, because the Scripture just uses such powerful language, and the language that it uses doesn't offend people because it's strong. It offends people because it's true. Right? Like, for example, if I say to someone, oh, the New England Patriots are a terrible team, they don't care. They just ask me, how many Super Bowls have we won? If someone says to me, the Bills are a terrible team, I go, well, that hurts. <laughs> because it's true. Okay? So Ephesians 2. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Right there, just you were dead. That is not a nice thing to say to someone. In which you used to live, in which you followed the ways of the world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest... We were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast." For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So, as I mentioned, Scripture uses very powerful language to describe what is true and the transformation that can take place in our life. And according to Scripture, finding life in Christ is like moving from death to life. Now, a lot of people think that Christianity is just a kind of a way to, to live a better life. You just have access to information, and, and you just tend to do a better job at life. For some people, use Christianity like a vitamin, uh, just a supplement to life. Makes you a little healthier, makes you a little stronger, maybe you live a little bit better. But Scripture presents something entirely different. Paul describes it's the difference between death and life. I, I can't imagine how wide a range that is, or an explanation that could be any wider than that. And so what Paul wants us to know is that the difference makes, that grace makes in your life is that, first of all, you are made alive with Christ. You are made alive with Christ. By that, he's not just saying you have a heartbeat and respiration. There are people who have a heartbeat and respiration, and they are in life support. In our culture, lots of people settle for life support when they could have life. It's how people live. We need something more in life than just heartbeats and breaths. We need meaning. We need purpose. We need something that's greater than ourselves that we can connect with and be involved in. And, and if we don't have that, then all that's left is just kind of to live self-centered and selfish lives. And and scripture tells us that whenever we go into that mode, what happens is, is we wind up inserting kind of like a corruption of death into everything that we are involved in. So he says you are made alive with Christ. The second thing he shows us is that you are raised up with Christ. You are raised up with Christ. Uh, 
death is kind of like the ultimate solitary confinement, right? So you're buried and you're in a box. This is, there's not a lot you can do from that position, right? It just doesn't happen. I love to tell this story, but when our church was less than 20 members, a person came in and visited on a Sunday, and they, they after the service, they came up to me and they said, does this church have small groups? <laughs> And I said, we are a small group. If it gets any smaller than this, it's solitary confinement. And that is considered a form of punishment in every culture in the world. All right? And he did not come back. Okay. So I really messed that one up. So the idea is that we often feel held down or pushed down, held back or pushed down by circumstances or individuals in our life. So I could have graduated from, but, and then we fill in the blank with something or someone that seemed to hold us back or keep us down. I could have had that job. I could have had that relationship. We always have something that feels like it's limiting life with this kind of solitary confinement we keep getting forced into. And it winds up making us feel frustrated and sometimes bitter. And there's a lot of regret that goes along with those kinds of statements. So... We're surprised when we are told that there's a kind of freedom that God calls us to, that we're raised up, that we're not supposed to be held back or pushed down, that, that we're supposed to be able to live out this amazing life of grace, and it is life to us. So we're a little bit surprised when Paul tells us that we have been created to do good works, not just acquire good things. See, it's not wrong to acquire good things, but that's not what we are created for. And so if we constantly try to live out our life in ways that are just about obtaining good things or being frustrated about not having them, we will often feel as though we're being held back and pushed down. The third thing he tells us is that you are seated with Christ. You are seated with Christ. Now, if you walked in this morning and you were coming down the aisle and somebody scooted over and said, here, sit next to me, by and large, that's a pretty positive thing. But if you went to sit down and someone came up to you and said, excuse me, excuse me, that seat is saved. By grace, through faith, it is a gift of God. No, that seat was not saved, all right? That, that, that seat is just being reserved for someone else. It's a very different experience. What Paul says is that Christ has called us to seat, sit with him in heavenly places. Now, the whole concept about heavenly places is a lesson to itself, and I don't really have time to go into that this morning. But the point is, the first thing it shows us is acceptance, He's, he calls us to sit with him, but it doesn't just stop there. It's also a position of authority because Jesus is seated on a throne. That's where he sits. And so he calls us up to sit with him so that we can see what he sees and does what he does. Do what he does. That's what God wants us to experience in our life. So we're seated with Christ. It's more than just proximity. This life of freedom, this life of authority, this life of, of, of acceptance from God is a gift. That's what Paul tells us. It's a gift. Usually, if you're going to get anything in this world, there are points you have to earn. There are programs you have to buy. There are exercises that you have to do. I mean, have you seen any of the, any of the infomercials on television? You can lose all kinds of weight if you either buy this, this little pill that you just, you, you take it and the weight goes away, or you take the, the you buy this little extra piece of exercise equipment that, that it's so convenient. You can, you can actually just slide right, it'll slide right under your bed, it'll, right under your bed, where it will live for the rest of your life. Okay? Owning one of those things does not make the weight go off. See, there's stuff you have to do, you know? Uh, because of my travel, sometimes I, I enroll in, in, in things that are supposed to give me points. And, and if I stay at a hotel a certain number of times, eventually they will, they will give me a discount or, or they'll give me a special parking space or, or they'll give me, the, the, the last one gave me free water on the way in, which, you know, um, okay. When my daughter was, was, was going out to visit colleges, she was going to go to college, I remember we were on a college visit, and, and somebody, one of the parents, we were doing a tour, we looked like a bunch of geese behind something, you know, just going, and, a, and a person said, oh, does, it, 
what about this? Does the college include this? And the, the person leading the tour says, oh, yes, that's free. <laughs> and I said, oh, no, it's not. <laughs> it's included. That's not the same thing. Okay? Kind of had this idea. We, we build points. We, we, we buy programs. We, we exercise. We work our way up. And then there's this concept that God invades our world with and says, it's none of the above. It's a gift on the basis of grace. So the way we receive this gift of life from God is through faith. So now if all of this access and, and life and authority and freedom is available to us by grace through faith. We, we really need to understand what faith is, because if this is how we access this, what is that? And it, faith is just simply a decision to trust what he has done more than we trust what we have done. That his work on the cross and in our lives is more than our work. That's a really big concept, and it's so simple that people struggle with it. We like to feel like we've earned something, but the problem is, is that once we feel we've earned it, our tendency is to boast, and God wanted to take all the boasting out of our experience in grace, and so it's through faith. Now, receiving grace through faith actually activates you. There's this fear that if it's a gift, if I didn't have to do anything to earn it, or to deserve it, that then I won't do anything after receiving it. And uh, what you should know is that Christianity is not a faith that says we should do nothing. Christianity doesn't say do nothing. Christianity says you do what you do for different reasons now. You're not trying to earn acceptance or approval or applause or recognition. Now you do something out of a grateful heart and because you feel like God has created an opportunity that you've actually been created to do something, to make a difference in the world in which you live. Now, this is a legend. So I'm, if, if someone comes up to me afterwards and says they researched this and found out it wasn't the case, your research is better than mine, so I, but, but I heard this, this story. Someone once went to Ernest Hemingway and asked him to write a story in six words. Has anybody ever heard the six-word story by Ernest Hemingway? Okay, so he took up the challenge. Can you write a story in six words? And this is what he wrote. For sale, baby shoes, never worn. That's a whole story. So the online magazine decided that they would challenge people to try to summarize their life in six words. Think about it. Your entire life, six words. How would you do it? So people started responding. In fact, they responded so much that they actually shut down the website. It, it, they, they weren't prepared for all the response. And eventually they created, a, they wrote a book based on this uh, called Not Quite What I Was Planning, which is also six words. These are some of the things that came in, all right? One tooth, one cavity, life's cruel. <laughs> okay? <laughs> See that? How about this one? Cursed with cancer, blessed with friends. How old do you think that person was that wrote that? He was nine years old. Or this one, thought I would have more impact. Thought I would have more impact. I think a lot of us live under the idea that we really can't make that big of a difference in our world. We were hoping for more. We were expecting more. It just didn't happen. And there's lots of reasons why we don't engage in those opportunities to make a difference. Sometimes we feel too old. Sometimes we feel too young. Sometimes we feel too poor or too busy or too important. Uh, we don't have enough time. We don't have enough money. We don't have enough knowledge. We don't have enough training. We, we have all kinds of reasons why we can't engage. But here's what you should know. Every time we find a reason, we don't do what we were created for. We've learned how to walk through life without leaving any imprints. We're, we're like spirits that pass through a life and there's no evidence that we were ever here. And it's not what we were created for. 
There, there are occasions that people describe they feel they have nothing to offer. And, and they're afraid that if they try, they, they, will, they will get it wrong. And here's what I want you to know, is that doing nothing is not superior to doing the wrong thing. It's not any better. So we have to learn, were we really created? Were we really created to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do? So God has created each one with a desire to make a difference. It's embedded in our DNA. This isn't a cultural phenomenon. This is what people always want. What's interesting is that the very thing our heart craves is what we shy away from when the opportunity presents itself. Something about the significance of that moment, while we're attracted to it, we're all also concerned about it. We tend to take a step back. So if we're worried, we will get it wrong. We won't do anything. And, you know, I don't know if you realize this, but pastors make mistakes too. I, uh, I've, I've made mistakes in weddings. It's true. Um, I, I was performing a wedding for someone. Uh, his name was Gary. Her name was Liz. But at the end, when I pronounced the name, I pronounced them Giz and Larry. <laughs> And they have sent me a Christmas card every year, signed Giz and Larry. It's true. Of course we can get it wrong. That's not the worst thing. The worst thing is to live our entire life and not figure out why we're here. Playing it safe and prioritizing our own self-satisfaction will not change our world for the better. And by the way, it won't change us either. The goal of your life should not be, does not have to be, to live as comfortably as you possibly can. A better goal is to live as deeply as you can because there is beauty that should be seen and there is truth that should be learned and known and there is love that should be released and received and there is faith that can be lived out and yet we settle for comfort when we could go deep. God didn't promise us a comfortable life. He promised us a real life and they are not the same thing. You cannot make a difference or reach your potential without serving others. That, that if we want to make a difference in our world, it's not going to be because we gave an order. It's because we took advantage of an opportunity. That's what makes the difference. So usually when we're walking into a serving mindset, there's a thing that we do. And that is, is that we calculate the cost, time, resources, whatever it is, to complete the entire project. And then when we, when we look at that, and then we assess what we have, we go, well, what I have won't make a difference. And so we, we give up. What God calls us to do is rather than try to figure out what it will take to complete everything, just calculate what part you can play and release that. Engage in that. Now, you might be sitting here this morning and go, oh, I know what this is. This is a message to get me to sign up to teach children. And it's not. We have lots of opportunities, dozens of them in which you can serve around here. This isn't just a way to get work done in the church. This is a way to live in which you actually make a difference in your world. This isn't just something you do on Sundays when you've been recruited and you've been scheduled. This is something that we do every single day of our lives. That we can make a difference in every place that we go because God has created us to do good works. And he's done all of this even before we took our first breath. So uh, God, God understands that when we serve others, people begin to realize that he cares. And this is what I want you to know. God does care deeply about two things. He cares about meeting another person's need, and he cares about the person that we are becoming. And serving is how he addresses both of those things. So God prepares serving opportunities in advance by investing spiritual gifts in our lives. By investing spiritual gifts in our lives. A lot of our life 
uh, is, is filled with certain capacities and abilities that we actually we can monetize, we, we can take advantage of. Uh, most of the time we're employed because uh, we do something that we're reasonably good at and someone will compensate us for that. And we all have talents and abilities. That some of you people here this morning, you, 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 you have an artistic ability. You, you can take a pencil and a piece of paper and turn it into something that people go, oh, that, that's pretty nice. If you give me a pencil and a piece of paper, 99.9% .9 of all refrigerators in America would refuse to display my work. <laughs> It's not going up there. And, and you have to realize the standard threshold for refrigerators in America is really, really low. <laughs> Maybe you've got a good voice. If you have a good voice, you might develop it and you might work on it, but you didn't create it. If you're good looking, what did you do to become good looking? Like you can accentuate it. You can add to it a little bit. But if it's not there, what are you going to do? Not a thing, right? Did I hurt your feelings? <laughs> if you're offended, it's not because it's harsh, it's because it's true, yeah, so. No, every, everyone here is good looking. Peter put it this way, each of you should use whatever gift you've received to serve others. I mean, even think about that. Instead of how can I use beauty or good looks, to get others to serve me, how can I use that to serve others? That's a really good question to ask. How can I use my vocal abilities, my artistic abilities, my creative abilities, my mechanical abilities, my administrative abilities, my leadership abilities, how can I use those to serve others? Because when I do that, I steward the grace of God in the world. Our world is all about how can I get someone to serve me if I am these things? And God just turns the table and he says, if you, will, if you will see it as an opportunity to serve others, it changes the world and it changes us. 1 Corinthians 12 says, Now about spiritual gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. Don't be uninformed that they exist. Don't be uninformed that God has already invested spiritual gifts in you. Before you ever took your first breath, he already put an investment inside of you because he has, he has created you to do good works beforehand. Before we ever get there, he's already created that. You have been given unique gifts to benefit others. It's a really big deal. And God prepares serving opportunities in advance by calling you. If I were God, I would do this differently. I would first call people and the one who said yes, then I would give them the gifts. Doesn't that seem like you saved something there? But God is so ridiculously generous that he actually invests gifts in you, whether you will ever respond to his call or not. Which is why that even people who have nothing to do with faith or spirituality or scripture, any of those things, they can be remarkable leaders and remarkable artists and all those things. God didn't, God didn't put it in you to leverage you. He put it in you so that you would make a difference in the world in which you live. He calls us. And everybody thinks, well, of course the pastor's called. But what I want you to know is that every one of us are called. Scripture insists that we are all ministers. We are all servants. We are all priests before God to make a difference in our world. And then God prepares serving opportunities in advance by presenting situations to respond to. We consider so much of our lives to be a coincidence or an accident. Uh, what if you saw that differently? Instead of coincidences and accidents, what if you thought that maybe at some point today, God is going to intentionally intersect my life with my ability and someone's need? What if there's actually divine appointments built into my day? That will change how you think about you going through your day. Now, just before we end this talk today, I want to talk about one more thing, and that is that God can actually use any emotion any emotion to motivate serving. Now, we understand some emotions, they just go right along with serving, right? If you feel sympathy, if you feel sorry for someone, well, that's an opportunity to serve. If you feel empathy, if you feel hope, like, I could do something that could make it better, that's an emotion to serve. Or, or delight, I, I just enjoy doing that. That's a good emotion to serve. But how many know those are not the only emotions in life? Right? Let's just see. How many here have ever experienced the emotion of irritation. 
Now, lots of people did not raise their hands. And all I would have to do is say, I'm going to stop and stay right on this point until everyone who's experienced that emotion raises their hand. And more and more people would begin to experience that emotion. And I know a secret. I know that in the beginning, everyone would be irritated with me. But I know the longer it goes, you would start being irritated with the people whose hands are still down. How could God use irritation? How could God use frustration? How could God use exasperation? How could God use aggravation to motivate you to serve? Because lots of times we experience those emotions and we go, well, those are so unusable and unworthy emotions. God could never use anything like that. Here's a little experiment you want to try maybe. Go read through scripture and identify the emotions of people before they did something for God. You will be very surprised what kind of emotions are involved. See, the truth is, is that sometimes we are frustrated, not just because we are inconvenienced, but because something could be better than it is. And all it would take is this. And a lot of us just leave with the emotion. We just go, if they would just do that. How much better would that be? And then we walk away. And maybe God is trying to get your attention. And he's using the emotion of your irritation or your aggravation to point attention to you. That's something you know how to fix. Maybe you could do it. Now, I will tell you that you can be motivated to start serving with irritation. But don't express your irritation to the people that you're serving. That is not a good strategy. We want to use the emotions that we experience in God-honoring ways to actually benefit others. So if you think that your emotion isn't pure enough for God to use, you should know that God can use any emotion. Now, any emotion can be misused, but that's not what God does. Your destiny is not to be a spectator. You have been created to make a difference. You are in this world for a reason. God has made investments in our life because he trusts that we will make investments in others' lives. God is changing the world one life at a time by one life at a time. That's what makes a difference. Jesus gave his one and only life so that we could actually have life. And this is what's fascinating. When Jesus comes, he comes in the form of a servant. And he wasn't disguising who God was. He was revealing who God was. Because this is how you make a difference in our world. So last week I gave you a homework exercise. And the exercise was to practice humility, engage humility, not by putting yourself down, but by noticing something good and calling them up. And this week, I'm going to give you another homework exercise to practice humility. And that is to look for an intersection of opportunity and need. And you just happen to be there. And maybe that's something God wants you to do. Let's bow our heads this morning. Um, one of the great deceptions we can buy into is that I don't really have anything to offer. And the moment you begin to believe that might be true, every thought that follows it will take you places you never want to go. That God uses anyone who's willing to be generous with the gift that he's placed in their lives. In the divine calendar of heaven, God is actually scheduling in opportunities. And you don't have to be a no-show. It's not a life commitment to help out in a situation. But it might be a life release. Not only will someone know that God cares, and at the end of their day when they're falling into bed, give thanks in a prayer towards heaven because someone made a difference in their lives. But you will have discovered something about yourself, too. That is that you are not just here for no reason. That there's destiny in you. There's purpose. And that God will use you. You. Over and over again. 
So Father, uh, help us. We often don't have a very high opinion of ourselves or the abilities that you have invested in us, mostly because we just compare them with others. Would you help us not compare them with others, but look for opportunities to release what you have placed in us with the heart of a servant. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand this morning.